prayer for those that are still sick. Brady, Brady has something he wanted to do. So, uh, two kids that I went to school with, they're actually twins, and their birthday's actually today, but they've lost both of their parents within the last month. So, um, I would like to see our church like send them a thousand dollars. Their names are Taylor and Taylor Stone. So, I know that they're kind of going through a really hard time right now, but they've also had like car troubles and turned through all their savings. You got a motion? A second to send them a thousand dollars. Any discussion about that? All in favor? Any opposed? I'm ready if, uh, if they get you a check and you get to it. Anybody that we need to add to the prayer list Billy Faye Coons had a little mini stroke the other day. It affected her speech and her eyesight and walking one, one leg. And anyway, she, she's had a little problem. Just remember her in prayer list. I think, I think Billy Mack's still in the hospital in San Antonio. <coughs> I need to pray for him. I talked to Perry just a few minutes ago, and he said, I'm going to get out of the hospital. <laughs> she's walking. She walked the first time today. She's ready to come home. It'd be hard to stay in there with that knowledge. <laughs> Wonderful. Anybody else? Those two twins, is it, uh, why don't we do a thousand dollars each on the, on the twins? You know, you want to up the up the ante to a thousand a piece? Yeah, they're young adults and they are having trouble with the car and stuff. I think that'd be better. You make it a motion? Yeah. That's a motion. You change that to two thousand instead of a thousand. I'll take it. Got a second in the Any discussion or confusion? All in favor? Any opposed? The Lord is good. It's good to be in this house tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to come into your house. Lord, we thank you for the good reports that we've had on those that are sick. We just ask that we continue to heal and to bless those that are, are still sick. And Lord, we just pray that you bless these, uh, these boys in the time of loss and their family. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to, for our church to be a blessing to them. Bless our time of study tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Second Chronicles. <coughs> did I say Second Chronicles? That's what I meant to say. 23. And uh, we're studying about Joash in the Old Testament. A lot of interesting events around this person, Joash. The last time we saw or looked at him, his grandmother... Thalia had plotted to kill all the possible uh, heirs to the throne, which, by the way, were her own grandchildren. She she had killed she had, she had had them all killed, all except for Joash, and uh, Joash was saved from destruction. He had uh, he had uh, some people in his life. He had an aunt that cared enough about him to he said that she stole him from among those who were. Uh, killed by this lady. Uh, he had, uh, had a priest named Jehoiada in his life that cared for him, had some guards that all of these people in his life that uh, formed a hedge around him. It's a wonderful picture of, of our salvation from sin and hell, not that the people in our life had anything to do with, uh, with saving our soul, but they uh, they brought us to where we could come to a saving knowledge of Christ. Now, I want to begin reading, pick up our story, our reading here in verse number 8. So the Levites and all Judah did according to all the things that Jehoiada the priest had commanded. It took every man his men that were to come into, in on the Sabbath with them that were to go out on the Sabbath. For Jehoiada the priest dismissed not the courses. Moreover, Jehoiada the priest delivered to the captain of the hundreds of hundreds, spears and bucklers and shields that had been King David's, which were in the house of God. And he set all the people, every man having his weapon in his hand, from the right side of the temple to the left side of the temple, along by the altar in the temple, by the king round about. Then they brought out the king's son and put him on the, uh, and put upon him the crown and gave him the testimony and made him king. 
Jehoiada and his sons anointed him and said, God save the king. Now when Athaliah, that's Joash's grandmother, when Athaliah heard the noise of the people running and praising the king, she came to the people into the house of the Lord, and she looked, and behold, the king stood at his pillar at the entering inn, and the princes and the trumpets by the king, and all the people of the land rejoiced and sounded with trumpets also the singers with instruments of music and such as were taught to sing praise. Then Athaliah rent her clothes and said, Treason, treason. And Jehoiada the priest brought out the captains of hundreds that were set over the host and said unto them, Have her forth of the ranges, and whoso followeth her, let him be slain with the sword. For the priest said, Slay, slay her not in the house of the Lord. So they laid hands on her, when she was, and when she was come to the entering of the, of the horse gate by the king's house, they slew her there. We'll stop reading there. But uh, this portion, this portion of our story, uh, makes a good, I believe, a good type of Christ as the king and his subjects and the enemy, which would be, in this case, portrayed by Athaliah, the grandmother who was ruling Judah at that time. And, uh, and so it makes a good type or a good picture, I believe. And I want you to think of the picture tonight of the people of God praising the King of Glory. And as the praises go up, the devil despises the Lord and his people all the more. And that's kind of what we see played out here in this, in this story, in this part of the story. Notice the stir that's caused by the anointed one. A little boy, I think he's about six or seven years old at this point. They bring him to the to the uh, to the to the temple. Well, he lived in the temple. He had been living in the temple, and they bring him out and uh, and and crown him as the king of Judah. And notice the stir in verse twelve. It tells us that they were running and praising the king. At least. I think that's what it said, unless I picked up accidentally picked up my Pentecostal Bible. I think that says they were running and praising the king. I didn't do a whole lot of study on on running uh, because I, it doesn't just bear a whole lot of looking into. I found exactly what I thought when I looked up the word. It said, for whatever reason, run. And so that's what they were doing. Uh, they were running. Uh, verse 13 says, all the people of the land were rejoicing. Why? Why, why, the, why the big deal? They lived under the tyranny of this lady who was uh, a known murderer and killer and a tyrant. And uh, not only that, but she was an idolater and uh, came from the family of, of, uh, of uh, Ahab and Jezebel and all, the, all of that. And so... Why were they kicking up such a fuss, if you will? Well, first of all, think about this. The king, this little boy here, this king was their escape from the tyranny of Athaliah, who is the enemy in this story. It's their escape. Think about that as it applies to us spiritually. Our only hope of salvation is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the writer of Hebrews said, How then shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Uh, our only hope. And not only that, but they were rejoicing because providentially, Joash had been preserved and, and he had been sent to be the king of Judah. At the end of verse 11, uh, there's that phrase that uh, Jehoiada makes. He says, God saved the king. They knew who was behind uh, the king, he, they knew who was behind him being preserved. God saved the king. Reminds us, reminds me of how we're not, uh, as children of God, we're not depending on our own power to stay saved, but God is the keeper of our souls. God saved the king. Also, Joash was the anointed king. Whether Athaliah liked it or not, 
He was the king. He had more power than his grandmother, even at six or seven years old. His authority would overrule her authority. You talk about uh, shouting and running ground for a child of God, for a Christian. Uh, there was one who hated us, the devil. He wants us dead. He wants us in hell. But we have one greater, the Lord Jesus Christ, and His authority overrules. He talks about, I have overcome the world. We're overcomers in Christ Jesus. I had the privilege this past week of witnessing and leading a young lady to the Lord. And uh, we had us a time. A time talking about how good it is just to be saved. I mean, I don't recall either one of us running around or or, uh, or making any weird noises, but the outside world, nonetheless, would have thought we lost our mind because we're sitting there talking and crying and snotting about how good God is. And it's just wonderful to know that we have a, a way of escape through Jesus Christ, that we're saved forever. And, uh, and, and, and this is what... This is what was stirring things up. They were in the middle of worship, if you will, as a tithe. Notice the organized worship service. Verse 13, the king, we find, had a centralized place of honor that he occupied in the temple. It says that she found him there by his pillar. That's a, that's a place in the temple where the king would be. It was a place uh, prepared for him, a place of honor. Uh, and so he had, a, he had a place. We come together in the house of the Lord. Uh, we ought to make sure that Jesus is welcome in our midst. Would you agree with that tonight? And through, uh, through prayer and through preparing our hearts uh, for worship, we make welcome the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus in our midst. And, uh, and, and, and a lot of times I think that we don't do more and say more and, and uh, sing more or whatever in, in the worship services because we're not prepared. Now sometimes it's because we're uncomfortable doing it and everybody understands that. But a lot of times we're just not prepared. We need to prepare our hearts for Worship and prepare Jesus a place in our worship. When we come to church, I think you ought to get up on Sunday morning. Uh, I think you ought to dress for church. There, I said it. I'm not going to take it back. I think that we ought to uh, have a song in our heart and a prayer on our lips and a praise on our on our lips for the Lord when we come to worship and inviting Him to be in our midst and in our presence. You'll notice the trumpets. These trumpets were not uh, not like what Morgan Cape was playing the other night at the at the Christmas deal. These trumpets were uh, made out of an animal's horn. They were used to blow one note real loud. They were used to be heard for miles and miles and miles. Uh, these trumpets, as an instrument, uh, they were used to announce and to proclaim something. The trumpets in the Old Testament were blown for three major reasons. They blew the trumpets for a wedding, they blew the trumpets at wartime to call men to battle, and they blew trumpets in the time of worship, like the year of Jubilee or whatever, and uh, to gather people in for worship. In the New Testament church, uh, the church has a voice that's divinely called and set aside to announce and to proclaim uh, to warn and to call to worship. This voice is the voice of the preacher or the pastor. Preaching all throughout the Bible in the Old Testament and the New Testament is compared to that of a sounding trumpet. In fact, Paul addressing the subject of preaching or more specifically prophesying in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 8 he makes the statement or poses the question, if the trumpet make a strange sound or an uncertain sound, uh, how will they prepare for battle? How will they know that it's time to prepare themselves for battle? The preaching, uh, the preacher is the pulpit trumpeter. <coughs> and, uh, and, and, and what the people of God need in these days and times is a, is a trumpeter, one that can be 
heard, one that can be uh, dis is distinct in what he's saying and, and sticks to the word of God. Uh, who stands forth to trumpet, thus saith the Lord, shouting the good news of God's love, shouting the warning of God's judgment, shouting to praise to the, the praises of Christ as long as God gives him bread. It also mentions in verse 13 the instruments of music and the singing of songs. Interesting phrase here. And I don't want to skip over at the end of verse 13 down there at the end, towards the end, it says, such as were taught, such as were taught to sing. Now, I don't, uh, I don't think that, that uh, the singing was necessarily the emphasis here. Of course, the focus was on the king and the coronation service. But nonetheless, God thought it important to put in his word and I think it's important enough to uh, to reiterate that they were such as were taught and it's right to teach and uh, sing and teach music and teach uh, church music if you will and it forevermore added to the service here this was a praise service they weren't just running and, uh, and leaping and shouting but they were singing in an educated kind of a way. And music was there in an educated kind of a way. And the trumpets were sounding. Uh, think about this. This effort of praise on their part was reckless abandonment, if you will. Uh, they knew that the noise that they were making, and I, and I don't say that uh, to in any kind of a negative way, but they knew that the stir that they were making, that the noise that was going on in the house of the Lord would be heard outside. They knew that other people were going to hear, possibly people who did not agree with what they were doing would hear of it, but they did it nonetheless <coughs> unashamed. They didn't care what anybody thought. They shouted and they sang. And listen, they did it all without a PA system. Everybody heard it. Sometimes I wonder in our church if, if our PA system, if we're using it to enhance our worship or if it's just a crutch or an excuse to not have to put our whole heart into it sometimes. But they didn't have any trouble hearing these people. It was reckless abandonment, if you will. Then notice, notice Athaliah, the enemy. Verse number 12 tells us that she heard the noise. She heard what was going on. When Athaliah heard the noise of the people running and praising the king, she came to the people into the house of the Lord. She heard the noise. She looked and saw the king at his pillar. She saw the king high and lifted up, if you will, uh, in verse 13. And she come running. Can I remind you tonight that our greatest threat in worshiping God and following after the will of God is not our friends that might uh, make fun of us. Our greatest threat is not our family who might not understand what it is that we're doing. But our greatest threat in the work of the Lord is the devil who hates God. And uh, he hates us and Make no mistake about it. He hears our praises and our worship as they go up. Notice the emotional response at the end of verse number 12. It says she rent her clothes. That's, a, that's something strange to us, but that's, that's a custom that they had in Bible times. It was an outward expression, a, a, a sign, if you will, of deep sorrow, uh, but also... It was also a, an act of great indignation. Sometimes it was done as a, as a sign of deep sorrow. Kind of like when uh, Reuben went back and found out that Joseph had been taken out of the pit. It said he rent his clothes. He was, uh, he was sorrow. But also an act of great indignation or anger. In Matthew chapter 26, the high priest asked Jesus, Tell me, we want you to confirm are you saying that you are the Son of God? And Jesus answered him, and he rent his clothes. Uh, he was mad at, uh, at what Jesus had to say. 
This right here in our story is more than just her being sad, but she was mad because they were crowning the king. She was mad. The devil gets mad when God wins. That's just the way it is. The devil's still mad about something that happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus came forth out of the grave. He can hold a grudge for 2,000 years. Give some of the people in my family. He's been, uh, he's been tormenting the church and the people of God ever since. He's mad about that. He's mad because you got saved. He's mad because you're in church. He's mad because uh, you're trying to witness to people and tell them how to be saved. I mean, he thought he had us all killed and, 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 and we were as good as in hell and then Jesus came along and we got saved and, and, and he's mad about it. You can't fly underneath his radar. The devil is mad. And God and His people. People of God, we've got a choice to make. And you're just going just gonna to go all in for God and let the devil be mad. And by the way, God knows how to deal with him. Just let him be mad. Or we can try to tiptoe around and not stir things up too much. And let me tell you something, he'll still be mad at me. He's mad just because you're saved and just because he can't get to your soul. She was mad. Rent her clothes. And she makes an interesting accusation against the king and his people at the end of verse number 13. She stands in the midst of the house of God and people of God and yells treason. 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 We know that word. That to mean to, to forsake or to betray. Almost always negative. We talk, usually talk about uh, treason in a, in, as far as a, a citizen of a country or during wartime or whatever. It's almost always negative except when we're talking about switching over to God's side. Then it's not so negative anymore, is it? She had, she had committed the true treason when she chose her way over God's way. The same we read about Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14 and the devil chose his way over God's way. He was the truly treacherous one. He's the one that committed treason against God. Uh, he chose his way over God's way. And I mean, for the child of God, yes, we forsook our sin. Yes, we forsake our old life. Yes, I forsook my old spiritual family and I've been transplanted into the family of God by grace through faith. I'm glad I am. I, I, I'm not going to feel sorry about turning my back on the devil. Uh, I don't regret it. I'm glad I'm saved. Her goal now was to try to find some people in the house of God who could be persuaded that they were wrong in forsaking her. Some that would jump to her aid, even if just temporarily, that would join her cause she needed some followers, if you will. In the middle of verse 14, the priest said, any that follow her, slay them. Slay them. She needed some followers to get, to get what she wanted done. It's interesting. When she's in search of people who would follow after her and join her cause, she doesn't go to the next kingdom. She doesn't go to the next town or even the next street over. But right there in the house of God, she tries to recruit people to her side. Treason, treason, she shouts, and hopes that someone will take her cause. It's exactly what the devil does. He goes straight for the house of God. Why? Why? Because it has, a, it has more impact. It has more power to it. Nobody expects lost people to be faithful to God. But if the devil can get some believers to jump sides, even just for a while, there's a great power to that. I've looked in both of the places, 2 Kings 11, 2, Kings 11, 2 Chronicles chapter 23, both of these places, and I can't find uh, where she was ever able to recruit anybody. Verse 15 makes it pretty clear that she died by herself. Uh, she died alone in her cause. And I got to thinking about that. Unfortunately, the devil is more successful in recruiting us from time to time than she was. Uh, he can't change our eternity and thank the Lord for that. But he persuades the flesh to come on over for a little while, every once in a while. 
And the, the result in that is believers die out of the will of God. I'm not talking about lost. I'm just talking about they die having not lived in the will of God. They die outside of the house of God. And as I read this, I thought in my own heart, I want to be found in there, in there where the crown and the testimony is. And where the people of God are, the power, the, protect, the provision, and the protection of God is. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for allowing us to be here tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the examples that are set before us in your word that we might live according to your will. Lord, we pray again for all those that are sick, praising you for the good reports. Asking you to continue to heal those that are sick. Lord, we just ask that you keep us safe until we can return in your house again on Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.